We're going to start now with the first with our first panelist. We can go back to the results later if we want. But uh, our first panelist is Nick Coldry, which is an honor for me to introduce uh, him to you. That is a professor of media communication and social theory at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And from 2017 has been a faculty associate at Harvard's Beckmar Klein Center for Internet and Society. He's the author or editor of 15 books, including The Cost of Connections with Elises Mejias, the Stanford UP 2019. And he's a co-founder of Tierra Común, Tierra Común, which is a network of activists and scholars who um, research around these topics. So you can follow Nick uh, on different social media that we're going to post on the chat. And well, Nick, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Thank you, Sophia. Let me try and um, share my screen. Um, just one second. Hopefully you can see my uh, slides okay now. Um, well, it's, it's, it's an honor to be part of this panel. It's a real pleasure. Uh, buenos dias a todos y todas. Um, what I want to do is really just take you through the core idea of the, the book, which as Sophia said, uh, I published um, three years ago with Ulysses Mejias, who is from Mexico, although he lives in the United States now, and I'm speaking to you from the United States uh, right now. The book, The Cost of Connection, how data is colonizing human life and appropriating it for capitalism. And in that book, we introduce the concept, we weren't the first to develop it, but one of the first of data colonialism, um, which is our explain is slightly different from digital colonialism, some versions of that, but it's not the terminology we need to worry about today. It's the core ideas. And that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, we see our work as part of a much bigger shift in the past decade, what we call a decolonial turn in research into data and technology, activism in relation to data and technology, a decolonial turn, uh, which encompasses those who argue for a digital colonialism, those who talk about techno-colonialism, algorithmic colonialism, and so on. What are the core points of this whole approach, which maybe can be foundations for our discussion today? The first is there is no capitalism without colonialism. I can't stress that enough. So much writing about capitalism, including Marx sometimes, does not refer to colonialism. But it's essential to refer to colonialism. And that's not just because colonialism was a stage that came before capitalism, which was basically what Marx argued. But of course, colonialism continued during capitalism. It provided the the fuel, the profit that, that drove capitalism to start. And for example, the slave plantations in the US continue to provide massive profits for the UK, the US and so on as capitalism developed. So no capitalism without colonialism. That's just as true today as it was 150 years ago. But the second point which Ulysses and I emphasize is that we don't need to think of colonialism as static. Like every other major phenomenon in history, colonialism can evolve. It does keep evolving. And in our view, data colonialism is just its latest stage, its latest form, its terrifying new stage where it will evolve into more inequality. But at the same time, we stress that this doesn't mean that data colonialism somehow replaces historical colonialism, because as I've just said, colonialism continues. The, his, the relics, the legacy of historical colonialism are just as powerfully with us today as they were 30, 40 years ago, and in some ways as they were 200 years ago, as I'll come back to. So that means that when we see something new emerging, which is data colonialism, it always emerges alongside the continuing effects of historic colonialism historic colonialism, the racism, the distorted geopolitics. At the same time, we want to argue there's something distinctive about 
data clones. So what could it be? The first point to say is that we're not saying that data colonialism in its entirety is entirely equivalent to everything that happened in the 500 years of historical colonialism. That in fact would be almost impossible because data colonialism has just started. Historic colonialism took 500 years to evolve. What we're saying as the point of comparison is that data colonialism performs the essential function of historical colonialism, which when we look beyond the detail was one core thing, a land grab of the world's resources. In Spanish, un despojo de los recursos del mundo. That was the key thing that colonialism was about. The idea that just one or two countries, Spain and Portugal initially, then Holland and Britain, then the US and so on, could seize for them, as if it was just for them, the whole of the world's resources without consultation, just seize it just for them. But the question we raise is whether as part of colonialism now evolving to a new stage, maybe it's possible that colonialism has the resources to seize another type of asset. And that other type of asset is human life itself everywhere. The capture of human life through the medium of data. Of course, the seizure of land and physical resources go on. The oil companies still drill in the sites in the Caribbean and elsewhere where they gained rights two or 300 years ago as a result of historical colonialism. But that doesn't mean to say that a new asset cannot be seized today. And that asset is human life itself seized through the resources of data. So as I hope you can see what we're trying to do is not to compare what's happening with data in the past 20, 30 years to the whole 500 years of colonialism. That will be a, a meaningless historical comparison. What we're doing is comparing the start of historical colonialism, its first few decades with today, which is the start of that new phase of data colonialism. And we don't yet know the long-term outcome of data colonialism, but it is very illuminating, we argue, to compare it and the confusions that we have today with the confusion that was right at the beginning of historical colonialism. When, for example, at the court of the Spanish king, there were debates about whether it was legitimate to capture the gold, the silver and the other part of the world. How could it be defended as rational? How could it be defended as Christian? These debates went on until they locked into a colonial mentality that we came then to know as colonialism. And that brings us to another point, because data is a special type of asset. Data is part of knowledge. Data seems to be part of how we rationally understand the world. And that means that this new phase of data colonialism, unlike, say, the seizing of oil, is part of a different continuity with historical colonialism, which is what the Peruvian sociologist Aníbal Quijano called the coloniality of knowledge. That long-term sense of the West, that the world's knowledge was there for it to control, that it was the West that was the center of the world's rationality. This, we argue, is at the core of the latest discourse around big data and artificial intelligence, which of course is exactly the opposite of what those who propound AI and big data want to say about it. They don't want to recognize that colonial continuity, that continuity with the coloniality of knowledge, but it's essential to do so. So those are the basic ideas. And just before I finish, and I admit these are quite complicated multi-level ideas, but I hope you've got the, the key points. I just want to ask, what does it mean to resist something as large and as complex as data colonialism? always in the context, as I said, of the continuation of the historic colonialism, which never goes away. The first point is that it's essential to be direct and to challenge directly the colonial reality at the core of contemporary talk about big data and AI. It's essential to challenge 
the fact that at its core, these practices, whatever the wonderful things said about them, are based on the capture of human life for business and for government power through the form of data from which value can be extracted, both for corporations and for governments. That's the core that we have to confront, think about, think about how to resist. And that means that although there are some wonderful words spoken about making AI decolonial, making AI more ethical, including within Google and many other places, they don't even begin to acknowledge this reality. So it's no good saying we'll make AI more ethical, we'll respect privacy in certain ways without confronting the key fact, which is today's data grab. The idea propounded by many organizations such as the UN, World Bank, UNESCO, the World Economic Forum, promounded and promoted for at least a decade that the world's data somehow is, should be just there for business to exploit, to develop in the interest of so-called human development. The idea of AI for the social good is fundamentally contradictory in our view because it ignores the fact that it cannot be a social good for the flow of human life to be suddenly available for capture by corporations for control by corporations, for influencing by corporations. This cannot be a social good, even though obviously it is a corporate good. It is a commercial good. So it's essential to challenge the idea of AI for the social good at a general level. But at the same time, it's essential in resisting data colonialism to do one final thing, which is to think very clearly and to resist, to identify, to analyze, to hear from the new types of injustice, which are distinctive to this new world when data colonialism overlaps with historical colonialism. New types of data related injustice, which are happening for sure in the global south, where the legacy of historical colonialism intensifies their effects. But also, and this is worth stressing, are happening in parts of the global north as well particularly for the disadvantaged populations who themselves are the long-term inheritors of the injustices of historical colonialism. For example, black, uh, black people, black single mothers we can imagine in the United States who depend for their insecure labor on the next message on WhatsApp or by text on their phone and therefore are required to have a smartphone even though it may be very expensive for them to have it, are required to accept the terms of whatever app is the one through which their work is available, who have almost no control over the terms of their data and the fact that they're constantly surveilled through every moment of their working life. That too is a form of data-related injustice, which is connected which, to the historic legacy of historical colonialism, but is a new type of injustice only possible in the digital era, which is related to data colonialism. So those are the core points I wanted to get across. I really look forward to the discussion. This is how to reach me. And the second website, there is the website for our book on the cost of connection, colonizedbydata.com. But thanks for listening. And I look forward to your questions and to the dialogue with the, with the other panelists. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nick. That was really interesting. And it was a great way to start, to start connecting capitalism with colonialism as um, a, a united thing that cannot be separated in the analysis and how data is really perpetrating this and taking it to another level. So thank you very much for those insights because they are going to be really useful for our later discussions. And now we're going to uh, head to Anita. Anita, which is, I am really honored to present you to Anita because she's a great uh, researcher, great professional, and a really dear good friend of mine. So I'm really happy to for you to be joining us today. Anita Gurumurthy is the founding member and executive director of IT for Change, where she leads research on platform economy, data, AI governance, democracy in the digital age, and feminist framework for digital justice, which is something 
really, really good that she does because all her analyses are always um, always have the feminist point of view in, in all what she uh, researches and analyses. So it's really good that she does that. I'm really proud of that. She serves an, as an advisor and expert on various bodies, including the United Nations Secretary General 10 member group in support of the technology facilitation mechanism, the Paris Peace Forum Working Group on Algorithmic Governance, Save the Children ICT4D Brain Trust, and Mindoro Tech and Policy Labs Board. So it's an honor to me to present you to Anita. Anita, you have 15 minutes to give us your input. So the floor is yours now. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. It's always exciting uh, to be part of TNI's beautifully organized events. And today is very special because I look forward to conferring with my co-panelists. So how is digitalization changing capitalism? Why is its infrastructure so colonial? Of course, this depends on how we view the arc of history. Um, we had a great presentation from Nick now, and he uh, tried to parse that, you know, the difference between colonialism and how digitality may be embedded. As activists and change seekers, we must claim the continuities of narratives of oppression and resistance, even as we develop the finesse, the sophistication to grasp the discontinuities. So both are important. Digitalization is not a technological process outside of such historical narratives. It's in fact a framing narrative. One, as an empirical referent, it represents the distribution of social power in the current conjuncture. And two, as a normative concept, it encapsulates the ingredients of resistance, change, and transformation. In Marxist terms, as Marx writes in 1858, digitalization may be seen as a new epoch of social knowledge, as a process where social life has come under the control of a new general intellect of networks and data and their mutations and equally holding the potential for non-capitalist forms of social life. So in some ways, already in the 19th century, Marx may be seen to have visualized the rise of intelligence capitalism, the intelligent cooperation that takes control of social life processes. Network data infrastructures, or to put them simply as platforms, are just, are at the base of the digital paradigm and at the root of the widespread inequality and injustice we see around us today. The difference in data capabilities results in huge differences in the ability of nations, communities, and peoples, and individuals to participate in the paradigm. Corporate power today is able to reorganize its operations, command and control its cross-border labor chains, exploit and extract resources, and amass and aggrandize wealth because of the technological genius of the internet as a global artifact and of data as a tool of discovery like Columbus. The corporation today is highly intelligent because it has grown a new cognitive tentacle. This tentacle bestows extraordinary powers for reordering and creating value and meaning. We all know now and I don't need to belabor this point that incessant data mining of social interactions and natural and social phenomena and things has given some companies and some countries a competitive advantage in what in common parlance is often referred to as the AI economy. Nation states, firms, politicians, businesses, everyone is besotted with, preoccupied with or angsty about the AI economy depending on who you are. So if you're a consulting firm, then you're terribly thrilled. But if you're a developing country, you're really anxious. However, as things stand in the AI economy, which is controlled by few firms, we actually see a few new threats to society. Not just social behavior, but life worlds, livelihoods, and ecological systems are all being encoded and datafied. From big pharma to big agri companies, everyone is in the race for data. Unfortunately, the conversion of the physical and natural commons into privately held social knowledge holds deep risk 
for how the oceans may be exploited, for instance, for advances in proprietary forms of personal medicine. So today you actually see in certain projects of the World Economic Forum, the oceans being excavated, extracted, encoded for advances in big pharma's strides, or for instance, how genetic sequences may be taken away from local communities for synthetic biology in northern labs. The commons of data produced from society and representing our collective heritage as humankind are already locked up. Labor that produces data for corporate AI is often hidden. We do know the visible drivers of Uber, but the alienated, often isolated and exploited workers in surveillance assembly lines of the platform economy are a growing workforce. They are the dispossessed, the marginalized, caught in traditional racial and colonial hierarchies reproduced by the AI economy for transnational capital. Also, the digital infrastructure which powers the contemporary network economy is based in large measure on unpaid communities of volunteers to produce open source code. This co-production, which big tech firms assetify or convert into assets, draws upon the myth of a unified community. But in reality, this is the cannibalization of the commons and the appropriation of the radical ideas of openness into the workings of capitalism. What is insidious and important is that infrastructures of society in all sectors are getting datafied. Public health is getting platformized. Electronic health records held by private hospitals are, are being used for medical research that is beyond public scrutiny. Education as a public political endeavor is reduced to a gamified industry. And alongside all of these is the steady loss of institutional autonomy for developing countries and their ability to keep pace and cultivate the public infrastructural capabilities for the state to perform its basic functions, allocative, distributive, and political. Platforms as cross-border entities are not bound by governance regimes based on considerations of public interest and equity, and states that lack access to digital resources that are locked up by foreign corporations are in a race to catch up that is like running in the same place. Data extraction also squelches and takes away local socioeconomic autonomy. It creates dependencies on foreign platforms in public and private sectors. Freedoms not only of the present, but freedoms as dreams, as imaginings of the future are also lost. The unidimensional utopia of AI futures driven purely by a profit logic demolishes any emancipatory possibilities even of capitalist modernity, the naive idea of a secular public often attributed to the processes of marketization. You must have heard of this argument very often, right? The whole process of liberal markets is going to create a kind of liberal society. AI value chains are notorious and Nick just spoke to us about that. And the celebrated discourse of innovation has only seen women, indigenous people, non-binary people and people of color struggle with the new slippery terrain of AI, how do they address, how do they engage with this terrain, you know, where they're actually losing ground that they have gained? AI value chains in today's mainstream digital economy bring back the specter of caste, race, and gender-based oppression to capitalism. They invert the secular public of the idealized marketplace into an inscrutable private of proprietary algorithms. Digital capitalism has found roots also to co-opt the indigenous peoples. A Canadian company, I've just read, plans to sell crypto tokens to offset carbon emissions that it claims will be created in partnership with First Nations. So as someone said, this initiative is greenwash, topped up with more greenwash garnished with blockchain. While the average European citizen may be able to claim some freedoms from market incursions, these are denied to people from the South whose intimate lives are an unabashed part of training data sets for AI models. Firms in the South cannot access rightfully the social resource of 
data pools from which they can create local value. Local governments cannot access the intelligence needed to plan to create local regenerative capacities in the economy. Privately controlled AI thus becomes the epistemic authority par excellence, unleashing a new feudalism and a new colonialism. I want to draw a parallel between the British occupation of India, which is colonial India, and you know, the contemporary movements in digital capitalism. In an essay written in 1853, Karl Marx pointed to the constructive role and he uses the term constructive role of British rule in India on the grounds that India needed some radical re-examination and self-scrutiny. Amartya Sen writes in his memoirs that this argument has a serious flaw in that there is an implicit assumption that British conquest was the only window on the modern world that could have opened up for India. As Amartya Sen says, what India needed at the time was a more constructive globalization which is not the same thing as imperialism. The distinction is very, very important. We seem to be tumbling down a singular idea of AI based on the premise of market valorization. The profits made by the East India Company from its operations in Bengal financed to a great extent the wars that the British waged across India during this colonial period. As Sen says, this robber ruler synthesis did eventually give way to a classical colonialism with rules, you know, a law and order and some reasonable modicum of governance. But even colonies do need reasonable governance, don't they, to classify who is deserving and who is not deserving. So today, powerful blocks like the OECD control the rules for the AI economy. We do talk about breaking up big tech, responsible code, ethical AI, and uh, you know what Nick talked about as you know, social value, all of which will be provided by the corporation. But this is all within the unquestionable consensus of racial, casteist, gendered, and other antagonisms of digital capitalism. So fast forward today, and we see a similar reality of the industrialization, loss of livelihoods, and de-democratization in the digital paradigm. So I'm going to just conclude with a small little forward-looking part. What do we need to see in this forward-looking look, forward part? Firstly, we need to pin down the injustices in clear terms. What is wrong with the current paradigm of digitalization? It devours the commons. It enslaves and indignifies human labor. It hollows out local knowledge. It erodes the normative consensus about the role of public institutions. It dislocates and displaces the power of choice, taking it out of human collectivities and transferring it to global corporations. And it perpetuates the myth that is just one utopia. We need intelligence to produce a different society, a society that values differently what knowledge is produced and how, and how knowledge is distributed in and through the network data commons. We need our post-human condition to be defined through a rights bundle that integrates three axioms, democratic in integrity, distributive integrity, and decentralized integrity. Democratic integrity for a diverse and egalitarian society, distributive integrity for economic justice, and decentralized integrity to make a participatory and institutionalized, institutionally federalized data order. As Pramod Nair argues, political thought will have to engage with new forms of the human, or to put it differently, we need to uncover continuously how rights, human rights emerge in the lived realities of those who are less powerful. So these may be many rights, the right to be free from data harms, the right to benefit from data innovation, the right to participate in the rules of data infrastructures, the right to be represented or not in data sets, and the right to access and use data. So I will leave these thoughts here and then continue with the discussion later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anita. We are perfect with time. Everybody finishes two or three minutes before their time. So I'm really happy that you are really um, staying <laughs> in your minutes, so we have time for everybody. So now our next uh, speakers will be Seda Gurses, 
which, which is an associate professor in the Department of Multi-Actor System at TU Deft and the Faculty of Technology Policy and Management, and a founding member of the Institute of Technology in the Public Interest, a gathering of activists, artists, engineers, and theorists that convene communities to articulate what technologies and technological practice in the public interest can be. And Miriam Aurubak is a digital anthropologist and reader at the Communication of Media Research Institute, University of Westminster. She's the author of the book Palestine Online and the Special Issue on Infrastructures of the Empire, together with Paula Charobak Rati, and the forthcoming Mediating the Max. Some. Her research and writing focus on grassroots movements, digital politics, infrastructures, and counter-revolutions. So, Miria Amseda, I'm so glad that you are here joining us today. You have 15 minutes to give your input, so right now the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, and uh, uh, on behalf of uh, all of us and TTPI, uh, uh, thank you so much for inviting us and being part of this conversation, and also it's really an honor to be part of event by uh, TNI. You're doing such amazing work, you're so international, so progressive, so critical, I wish uh, all uh, organizers and events were like uh, like yours really really amazing uh, uh, labors of love that you're presenting here so i'm going to start off and then i'll hand over to uh, uh seda so these are questions and discussions and uh, dilemmas and themes that we have been discussing about for uh, a while now also in the context of how as the institutes of technology in the public interest we look at questions of uh coloniality, decoloniality, uh, the digital infrastructures in ways that can offer uh, a multi-layered uh, critique. And so uh, first a few notes, I think about semantics and language because they are important. Uh, and I think they really matter in how we decode some of these uh, questions. I mean, there's um, a lot of sort of like, uh, mixing of terms when we talk about decolonization. So it's a colonial, the decolonial, and then there's decoloniality, and they have different sort of histories and genres in, 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 in ways that are important to understanding digital colonialism because they have different relations to questions of materiality uh, and resistance. So they have a role as a metaphor, but they also represent a reality. And so I think it's important to understand, uh, for us at least, uh, what it means when we talk about agency and resistance, what it means when, when we're done with the analysis, kind of like what Anita also was sort of pushing forward when we talk about the colonial uh, struggles, uh, what do we mean in terms of uh, forces of change? So there are different levels and there are often these level differences that are collapsed when we, we use certain terms. So this is where we would like to provide maybe some uh, suggestions and some uh, insights. And first of all, uh, uh, some suggestions and insights that are very simple concerns the, the issue that the digital is itself a colonial uh, force, is itself uh, um, uh, a metaphor for colonialism in a lot of these conversations, but the digital is also a tool that is serving the colonial. And so we would like to start with the first, where we say the digital is itself a colonial force. And so what we see is that colonial and imperial behavior um, is something that is also um, uh, uh, clear in the way the cloud or cloud-based operations have strongly tied workflows and internal structures of organizations to the growth and the growth mandates of computational infrastructure. So what do we mean by that? So we can see how this sort of uh, cloud-based operational infrastructures weakens the organization's autonomy that are relying on, the, on them or that use cloud-based uh, um, uh, functionalities. So we see that it weakens the organization's autonomy and its political uh, economy, but also in turn, it therefore weakens the autonomy of the users of these organizations. So we see a different level when we talk about digital infrastructures and digital coloniality in terms of the organizations and the institutions uh, providing services and the users relying on them. So imagine the impact of these transformations for the communities that depend on such organizations to 
provide, for instance, for very basic necessities. Now, we saw this very clearly. We don't need to imagine them anymore because we saw this very clearly during the pandemic. So uh, the COVID pandemic led to a lot of transformations. And in a way, we were live witnesses of organizations, such as, in my case, higher education, the university, but also healthcare, the NHS and other institutions moving to cloud-based usage in very dependent ways. And of course, it's crucial to understand these transformations, not as only something that happened in an instant. It was an operational shift that may have become visible overnight because of the pandemic and the way it was mediated uh, uh, across the world and, and, and day and night and 24 seven. And the pace with which it happened and the visibility that came from it uh, uh, was uh, extraordinary because of the crisis moment of the pandemic. But this has of course been very long in the making for public institutions and they should be understood through the lens of racial capitalism. So rather than capitalism uh, in and of itself, but a particular understanding of racial capitalism and the history also of colonialism and its relation uh, to capitalism, as also Nick uh, uh, alluded to. So in a way, I would like to sort of repeat what Paula Chakravarti asks, how does the history of European and American colonialism and white supremacy shape our understanding about platform economy, algorithm powers, and disinformation? And so these uh, answers can be framed in different ways, but I think that the, the suggestion that looking at it from a racial capitalist uh, uh, theory and analysis if, is very, very helpful if we're talking about decolonial or colonial, uh, um, uh, digital colonialism. So I think having an analysis about digital colonialism that pushes towards decoloniality, I think also means that you have to sort of uh, adapt your epistemology through to that. And so racial capitalism and the debates about racial capitalism in the last few years, are, I think center point uh, in that. So it's important to acknowledge that, uh, of course we agree, and it's very important to acknowledge the, uh, uh, the role of raw data and of course colonial extractivism, uh, myself and Seda, and, and, and Helen and Femke at TTPI wrote an article about this two years ago on colonial extract, extractivism and, and digital infrastructures because the material resources are key component uh, in how we understand power relations. Like power relations uh, have to do with material uh, resources. So when we talk about surveillance and when we talk about privacy, they seem like they're immaterial, but obviously they're very deeply entrenched in material uh, resources and power relations. And of course, over centuries, this has manifested itself uh, through a deliberate strategy of de-development uh, or what is called sort of non-development rather than even under-development is, is deliberate de-development that has uh, summarized itself in what became the global south and the global north dichotomy. So taking this further into the digital politics uh, discourse, this genealogy assumes that if we would then reverse it, so what if we reverse it and we say, well, what if data was captured by alternative companies or by software produced by developers in the global south? Would that then fix the problem? Uh, could it be something that is not extractive? Um, and our answer is no, because how can computational infrastructures be a key factor of our analysis if we deconstruct it through kind of historical and political uh, economic analysis, where we understand the digital as both the products and the systems. See here, I'm trying to separate these levels that I mentioned in the beginning. So the digital that you can capture in alternative ways, sure, as products, but what about the systems that they are part and parcel of? In other words, how can we approach digital infrastructures as also presentations of the logic in which all other digital means and technical functionalities have to pass through? Of course, it is important to imagine different ways of being connected and to imagine different kinds of devices and computers as, as, uh, as alternative infrastructures of connection. But how do we understand data as both the product that needs capturing, manufacturing, surveilling, controlling, and the operation in and of itself that uh, uh, it's sort of is its meta condition. So Seda, I pass this on to you. 
can we say that that by black boxing things like data that we actually won't be able to critically explore the mechanisms through which these things that are claimed to be happening come to be. In other words, how can we move from the symptoms of data capitalism or data colonialism, digital colonialism, to ask the how question, how to relate this to understanding material practices and infrastructures? Um, I'll do my best, Miriam. <laughs> and first of all, thank you for having us here. And uh, we're lovely. We're very excited to be uh, here representing the Institute, which also includes Femke Snelting and Miriam Ara. Ara um, sorry, Helen Pritchard. Miriam is obviously here. Um, so to kind of pick up on the question of how can we undo the black box that data as a frame on um, the, these technology companies produces, our starting hypothesis is that to turn it around in a sense and to say the mechanisms of big tech's expansion and revenues are not through data acquisition and sales, or for that matter, capturing and manipulating human behavior. Now, those are very, very big statements. So let me try to unpack what I what I mean to say when it's not about data acquisition and sales, and it's definitely not fixated on human behavior. So um, what we'd like to argue is that uh, these companies, and by these companies, I'm referring to the three companies that currently dominate the cloud infrastructure, um, that's Amazon leading, Microsoft following, and Google trying to catch up, um, and mobile devices, in this case, um, if we focus only on mobile phones for the sake of this talk, even though it's much more than that, I'm talking about Google and Apple which at least in most of the world control 99% of mobile phones. This will change as China and other countries make progress in this field, but that's um, maybe something for discussion or also with Jack. Um, so these companies um, depend on revenues, not necessarily for data, but that come in through their capture of operations. So Miriam was already using that term. Um, by operations, we refer to the management and allocation of institutional or organizational. I mean, sometimes institutions are made up of many organizations. So the management and allocation of resources for the conduct of institutional activities and the fulfillment of their economic, social, and politi political mandate, right? Like every organization has an operational unit that makes sure that all the resources are in place and available, people can be employed, their funds for things, et cetera, the operation of the institution. So for us, um, what happens with these infrastructures is that they either um, digitize those operations, making them dependent on the computational infrastructures, or simply um, create infrastructures that become the default go-to for exercising these operations. So in a sense, they hollow out or gut out these organizations. Um, the process through which they do this is not fixated on humans, although I'll come back to why humans are important in, for this infrastructure, but in many ways they collapse any differences um, between humans and non-humans or things um, in, in the sense that they manage all things that are kind of moving, be it human or non-human, uh, through this infrastructure and its mechanisms of, for example, optimization. So how do these companies capture what would be the internal operations of organizations? Um, they do this through their services. I mean, we've probably seen many of these ourselves. To be more concrete, they capture the internals and the funds um, of different departments. So for example, if an organization has a marketing or a communications department, uh, then the computational infrastructure becomes a default infrastructure for either um, advertisement or communications. So most institutions will have um, some use of these infrastructures to communicate with their uh, constituents. Or uh, if there are any logistical operations of an organization, delivery or moving things around or resource management, then the computational infrastructures present themselves as an alternative, as the most economically viable alternative, and slowly capture and reorganize the logistical aspects of these organizations. In the process, they also capture their funds. So. It is by having become the default computational infrastructure for the delivery of these services, these these tech companies are able to hollow out organizations, right? So if an organization has multiple operational departments, they become more and more dependent on these services. How come they're all dependent on Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Apple? So the answer to that is that they have managed to make the cloud plus the mobile devices that are attached to it. We see all of our so-called personal devices or phones as a kind of extension of the cloud. 
um, they have made this infrastructure the default go-to infrastructure for software production. That means any organization that expresses interest in digitalization, AI or not, will very likely pass through this infrastructure for the production of the software and for the delivery of it to its constitu constituents. And here's where the humans are important. The fact that we, not everyone, but a lot of us already have devices in our pockets, uh, which is an extension of this computational infrastructure, makes us addressable, which makes it then also the default infrastructure to go to when a government institution, or for that matter, a company wants to reach a, a, a broad swath of the population. So, um, so those are two things, right? Like just to kind of wrap it up, I know I'm running out of time. Uh, first is that uh, by virtue of being in our pockets, much of the population is addressable through these computational infrastructures, which makes them the default goal to for organizational operations and any operation that is going to be digitalized because this computational infrastructure has become the default place for production of software will also pass through these um, companies, which means that more and more funds and the structuring of organizational operations become dependent on the cloud plus mobile um, era that we are, uh, or the infrastructure that we're currently seeing. Um, <clears throat> maybe just to kind of add the hardware element, because we're going to come back to software in a moment, um, we can imagine already that by virtue of dominating the cloud plus mobile devices as a default structure, that these companies also influence the, the production of hardware. Right? We've heard a lot about microprocessors in Taiwan and, and the kind of geopolitical issues that raises because the dependency is very strong. But to reverse it around, these companies affect what hardware is produced. Therefore, they have the possibility to shape the future of how computation is organized. Um, therefore, they can shape that the way we develop hardware to um, basically exclude alternatives and to create even more dependencies on the infrastructures that they have. They do all of this, not just through technical means, but also financial needs. The fact that they um, capture organizations and claim things like you can move from making capital expenses into compute to just using our computation and making operational expenses, which means that you can be responsive to market volatility, um, et cetera, meaning that organizations don't have to put a lot of money into their tech, they can just go on the cloud. Um, they basically make an economic argument, which then also changes the economics of the institution inside out. So all in all, I think what we're trying to say is that the way um, computational infrastructures we have today, cloud plus mobile era, expands through capturing the budgets and the structures of organizations. In the process, they hollow out organizations that we already know are very, very, um, let's say, um, through many austerity measures and political decisions of the last 20 years, weakened. And many of these organizations also have colonial legacies. So we are in this very complex situation that if we unpack beyond the data frame and look into, we might understand better uh, by asking how is the computational infrastructure changing organizations and how can we reclaim these organizations back also from a decolonial perspective? Thank you. Thank you, Seda. Thank you, Mirjam. Uh, really, till now, everything is so interesting, so many good inputs to discuss and so many ideas to have. Now we're going to go to our last, uh, but not least, panelist, which is uh, Jack Chu, which is a professor in the Department of Communication and New Media, the National University of Singapore. He's the author of 10 books in English and Chinese, including Goodbye, I Slave, a manifesto for digital abolition from the University of Illinois Press in 2016, and Working Class Network Society from MIT Press 2009 and collaborates with Fair Work and Platform Cooperative Zoom Consortium to promote labor sustainability in digital economies. So you have 15 minutes and Jack, the floor is yours. I'm really happy to be listening to your input now. Thank you so much uh, for the kind invitation and uh, it's wonderful uh, to be able to uh, follow up, uh, you know, with uh, and also see my some of my most uh, favorite colleagues around the world, and uh, I'm uh, humbled, okay, but also very happy, okay, to uh, talk about. I would call this is my uh, 
little old book, okay, about Goodbye I Slave, published uh, six years ago, believe it or not. I started to write this uh, book uh, 10 years ago, uh, because at that time we just finished a campaign called uh, 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 I Slave, okay, against uh, uh, Apple and Foxconn, okay, the world's largest electronic a manufacturer in the world okay, that had a series of uh, worker suicides, right? And so, so this is an old book because the materials, most of the materials presented in the book was from uh, 10 years ago, around 10 years ago. And then it's a little old book because I know uh, slavery is such a uh, you know huge field. There are thousands of uh, books of which I only read a, a, a small fraction and many of them are more than 500 pages. Okay, my little old book is only uh, 200 uh, pages, a little more than that. Okay, so that's not why I call it a little old book. But it's a book I still think, okay, if you care about uh, the working conditions and uh, uh, digital capitalism, I, 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 I recommend everyone who's uh, listening here to to buy the book, because if you buy the book, I will uh, get one or two dollars uh, from your purchase. And all the uh, proceeds uh, that I receive will go to the Democratic Republic of the Congo to support uh, workers' uh, radio promoting uh, uh, human rights and also peace okay, in the eastern part of the Congo, where the uh, uh, the, the minerals, conflict minerals, okay, are uh, extracted. So if you buy the book, it's not just the, the uh, contents, but also uh, the uh, the money flow. Okay, will also contribute to our uh, international solidarity. I chose this image on the right hand side. Uh, I still don't know who created this image because uh, when myself and my colleagues in SACOM, this is a, a labor NGO in Hong Kong where I used to be until uh, two years ago. Uh, SACOM stands for students and scholars against corporate misbehavior. Right? So we started this campaign after the uh, uh, suicides okay, in Foxconn, that's a notorious Chinese factory. And then it became a meme. So there's a website called DeviantArt. Some uh, 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 visually gifted artistic person using this uh, username created this image, which I love. Because okay, uh, still I don't know, but it's a, it's a network effect. Someone I don't know, but they joined our uh, 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 campaign to and also visualize uh, our campaign in a very beautiful way, right? Um, um, and then also this image shows the body of the workers. Okay, maybe some of them are consumer workers, but my sharing in the next uh, ten minutes also will be focusing on the manufacturing wor uh, workers. Okay. But then these working bodies are racialized. They're people of darker color, skin color, right? And also it's gendered. There's a disproportionate uh, exploitation and subjugation of uh, female bodies in the factory zone. But then the, so the major argument, I know some of you listening to, uh, uh, to me talking about slavery and connecting it to digital capitalism, may be puzzled. Even some TNI colleagues uh, thought that uh, slavery uh, is not part and parcel of uh, what capitalism is, let alone digital capitalism. Okay, I think uh, uh, the difference is because we have different ways of defining slavery. Right? And uh, I would, I think it's, it's great. Uh, we had uh, uh, Professor Nick Caldry to start to say, uh, without uh, there's there, there is no capitalism without colonialism. So it's the same way I define uh, slavery as a historical, okay, uh, innate uh, component of capitalism. Okay, moving uh, from agriculture to industrial to digital modes of capitalism. They always uh, have slavery in it, either latent or uh, uh, but sometimes they are they are, they are uh, um, explicit right so this is a slave uh, ship going you know in the notorious triangular uh, uh, trade right and then this is the new atlantic this is the the, the brave new world of digital capitalism where uh, uh, enslaved bodies 
are essential okay to uh, the um, uh, to uh, to the accumulation process to make this uh, audacious I know this uh, is uh, audacious uh, arguments when I started to work out uh, this in part is because of because we already finished the I slave uh, labor campaign which uh, both uh, using our embodied okay uh, 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 social movements uh, offline but also online and then I, I, I as an intellectual in that uh, uh, in SACOM, you know I had a I thought it's my duty to add more intellectual uh, gravity, okay, to the uh, campaign. But then um, uh, it was it was really at the encouragement of uh, Professor Dan Schiller and Yue Zizhao, who gave me many references and more than that solidarity and support, so that I uh, could finish this book, uh, borrowing especially from historical and uh, legal uh, scholarship to argue that digital capitalism made some of the uh, hidden slavery uh, you know, uh, uh, more obvious, and also it spurs new abolition uh, movements. In the next few moments, I will just talk about the, uh, the first part of how uh, I slavery, okay, uh, slavery takes place in uh, uh, digital capitalism. This is, uh, uh, I would say it's, a, uh, it's, it's not just a definition for digital capitalism, this is my definition about all the uh, slaveries in modern history. A few days ago, uh, uh, the International Labor Organization, if you follow the news, had a new report released to say 21st century slavery. Right? And then um, uh, I went to the most important uh, scholarly definition okay, by lawyers and also anti-slavery NGOs is the Bellagio Harvard guidelines uh, on the legal parameters of slavery, which I attach at the very end of this book. And then um, uh, this uh, is my visualize to say, you know, all the historical forms of uh, uh, capitalism have to be built on empires, be they American or Chinese okay, or British, right? And then there are, uh, the, the, there's a quicksand of modernity where different modes of a, uh, uh, imperialist competition uh, would uh, clash with each other. And uh, sometimes they reach a relatively uh, stable uh, geopolitical, okay? We are now in the middle of transition from one uh, uh, era of uh, geopolitical, relative ge geopolitical stability to instability. But then on top of this empire, there, are, there will be an alienation. So state supported institutions of uh, labor, uh, 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 you know, so, uh, sometimes it's called the social death of, uh, of uh, uh, working bodies. But as long as there's alienation, there is resistance. And then the uh, manufacturing process need to be realized for uh, accumulation through uh, uh, consumerism. Okay, that is where uh, data and also surveillance, a lot of today's AI happen, and you realize the goal of exploitation under abnormal uh, market conditions when the labor cannot even on time get paid. Okay, or their uh, injured bodies, okay, are, are, are you know, are murdered, right? And so, so it's a, even though it's an extreme form of uh, alienation, but then according to the Harvard Bellagio uh, uh, principles, is that if these laboring bodies you know, are subject to ownership powers, which I will illustrate in, in the next few slides, and any of these ownership uh, powers, uh, like, uh, uh, like transfer, okay, like uh, profiteering, okay, if any of them uh, exist in the de facto status, it does not have to be de jure, you know, then they will be regarded as uh, slavery. And so the, um, uh, as we speak now, sitting in Southeast Asia, there are child labor being used to extract the, the tin right, in our uh, uh, digital devices, okay? Just like the Congolese conflict minerals. So the, even though the child labor, okay, all the uh, Congolese min miners, okay, they, uh, they, they do not sign a contract to say, I am your slave, but they uh, work in slave-like conditions. And that would uh, suffice to be called uh, slavery, according to Harvard Bellagio. Uh, uh, principles. So what I'm sharing in the next few minutes is based on, it's really emphasizing the materiality. So I know following my 
esteemed uh, colleagues, they already talk about data, AI, and cloud, okay, which has changed very quickly. But I'm talking about something happening. In my data collection was more than 10 years ago, but the same thing still continues today. Right? So this is the Wired Magazine article from 2010 after the suicide. I, I think many of you may still remember. Right? So I'd like to emphasize, especially in the global South, when we talk about digital capitalism, uh, in addition to the immaterial, okay, uh, and I in, in this book, I call it, called it the manufactured the labor, okay, the manufacture of consent, right, and uh, uh, but digital capitalism and colonialism in the consumer space. This is in the uh, production space. Okay, so I call this the uh, manufacturing labor. Okay, these are especially focusing on Foxconn, the world's largest. Okay, uh, when when this article was published, it was one million. Foxconn had one million workers in China. Uh, uh, when I started to write the book, this number actually increased to one point four million, which is larger. The number is larger than than all the armed forces of the U.S. United States combined. They had that, that was one point three million. So at one point, this is an army making iPhones. Right? And uh, here I want to emphasize: okay, digital capitalism. In order to understand digital capitalism. You know, we have to, uh, in the global South, we have to understand not just the software, not even the contents, not even the hardware. The emphasis should be uh, put on the laboring bodies of the workers who are being disciplined and suppressed to produce this hardware. If you pay attention here on the floor, there, there are two lines. If the, the workers stand or, or put a foot, uh, you know, the stool behind the line, uh, he or she will get a fine, for example. Okay, or, 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 and uh, not just a scout, but receive a fine from their meager salary. Here are uh, records, uh, SACOM, you know, my uh, former uh, uh, labor NGO. Uh, 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 it's a shame the NGO no longer exists because of the Hong Kong's new national uh, security law, right? And some of our comrades actually was uh, in jail. Right. And uh, uh, but then this was was what was uh, uh, you know th this is a record of how many workers committed suicide between January and uh, uh, especially uh, January and and May right so there's a series of uh, uh, fifteen uh, suicides and all of them are jumping right and um, and uh, uh, there there must be other kinds of suicide going on but this is only in the uh, uh, in the, because they jump, they died. Okay, so in this in the public space. So here is the, one of the massive okay uh, uh, workshop, the 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 workshop of the world for digital capitalism. It may look modern to you, but behind it, you know, there are something pre-modern, primordial that I would uh, compare in this book. Okay, so this is the dormitory of the workers. Who stand here when they uh, went back to the dormitory? The dormitory have three level bunker beds, and then the dormitories were secured by security guards who brutalized them. So these uh, dormitories actually could be compared to uh, feitorias. So this was the Portuguese for the trading centers. These are actually prisons for African, uh, you know, slaves to be gathered before they were sold. Okay to the uh, ships that would cross the uh, Atlantic to uh, reach to the uh, uh, Caribbeans. Right? So this is the start, we, we started to see the, the embodiments right, in the massive embodiments. The lower deck, okay, so this is a uh, uh, painting about how, you know, the African uh, embodied body, you know, they, they don't have enough ventilation when they were put in the cargo deck. This is similar in Shenzhen, it's a subtropical area and the, there were uh, journalists reporting about this, the, the, the odor, okay, it was almost suffocating because there was no air conditioning and very poor ventilation, comparable conditions. Buying and selling and the transferring of persons. Uh, our research group uh, spent lots of time to interview, uh, myself included, we interviewed many student, quote unquote, student interns, okay, they were forced to work in Foxconn, even though they hate it, they cannot endure the physical pain, but they could not run away because they were, uh, okay, uh, uh, um, essentially imprisoned, right, in the uh, uh, assembly line. 
And then on the and then the, their schools, the the these are working class schools. They call they are called the vocational education schools. They would get a fee, okay. And then even the gangsters who control them would get paid, right? Uh, in order for these uh, young uh, uh, students, some of them sixteen years old or fifteen years old, and uh, cannot they cannot run away, right? So this is comparable because they are the. The owners of these enslaved bodies can profit from the transferring of a person, just like okay in the Caribbean in the 1600s and to the well into the uh, 1800s. And this is a photo I take. You know, these are the dormitory at the bottom. They look like modern, but they're they're the anti jumping nets, right? Because there are many suicides, and the workers cannot even choose to jump. Anti-jumping nets only appeared in the history of capitalism on slave ships. Okay, so this is a, 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 a image actually from Times Magazine. Okay, uh, several decades ago, illustrating the story of uh, uh, Dach Aquiano, a West African boy who witnessed okay his uh, friends jumping out from the uh, the the nets. Okay, and then uh, get themselves killed. So this is the anti-jumping net, right? Uh, there are so many suicides that the uh, all the windows, uh, uh, the the rooftop, okay, everywhere was uh, protected by anti-jumping nets. I challenge all my uh, historian friends to tell me where else in the history of uh, capitalism there were anti-jumping nets to uh, uh, used against uh, uh, enslaved bodies. Uh, nobody can give me a third example. Okay, except the uh, in the during the triangular trade and uh, the uh, Foxconn uh, factory. And finally, this is my last slide before the uh, 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 before the break, right? And uh, this is uh, uh, this is the one survivor because she jumped. Uh, she was sixteen years old. Her name is Tian Yu, and uh, 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 her uh, she was paralyzed. Now she even now she has to uh, sit in wheelchair. Right, she cannot walk anymore, and but then she survived. And uh, uh, so the book also quotes from our interviews and also a documentary talking about her mental state, why she decided to jump and kill herself. Okay, and then that mental state can be understood precisely using the um, um, the uh, uh, Harvard Bellagio uh, uh, principle to pin down uh, my slavery charge. And, uh, and this uh, part of an analyzing the, uh, the enslaved bodies of digital capitalism ended with a poem from one of China's uh, 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 worker poets. Okay, his name is Xu Lizi. Uh, he also jumped and, uh, and he uh, killed himself, right? And that poetry uh, read like this. Let, just, let me quote, all right? Only death proves we were alive perhaps to Foxconn employees or similar workers called peasant workers in China, only death proves we were alive. Only desperation proves we are. Thank you. So now I have four questions for our panelists that I'm going to make, and then I'm going to go, we're going to pick some of the participants from the participants. So I'm going to ask first Nick uh, a question, and and Nick, in your in in your studies and your research, you talk about different forms of connection, and the fact that internet is dominated by a handful of companies, and um, I wanted to ask you about DAO technologies, which is a new way of connecting through blockchain communities. And they say they are decentralized and they are non-monopolistic and they are really participating all the community in this type of uh, uh, conversations and this type of uh, communications. So how do you see the development over blockchain and DAO technologies? Is there a possibility to make resistance with this type of technology? Me, myself, I'm personally pretty uh, critic with this type of technology, but I want to know your opinion on that. And how do you think... Um, really a non-monopolistic um, uh, form of connection should be done? Well, I think it's an important question because this fantasy of uh, blockchain as a way of creating a sort of counter organization to capitalism is, is very prevalent now. 
And the paradox is that it's, 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 a, it's a fantasy that's particularly popular amongst capitalists, amongst extreme capitalists. Um, very often men, as it, the leaders of this industry are almost always men, uh, white men. Um, and I think it's important to challenge this. Yes, we could perhaps imagine a world of complete social equality where access to devices and the computer networks was completely equal. And where we also didn't want to have a state representing the social where something like blockchain might seem to be a way of stabilizing that and ensure we never get a state back. <laughs> but laying it out that way brings out how weird this fantasy is. First of all, it, it, it just doesn't talk about the profound inequality of digital resources. It never discusses that. It just assumes this equalizes, so get hold of it. But of course you can't if you don't have the money to buy a Bitcoin. You can't if you don't have access to the huge computing resources and so on and so forth. The other side of the fantasy is to think that the state is automatically evil. Now, of course, there are many evil states in the world. There are many states that whose power needs to be resisted. But that's not the same saying as saying that we give up on the idea of the state as a potentially good representative of social forces and a social solidarity. Where does this fantasy against the state come from? It comes from extreme right wing ideologues who hate the state, who want to create a reality outside the state. So the idea that this is somehow a radical idea is really upside down. There's nothing radical about Bitcoin or blockchain. Um, it might seem radical in certain neoliberal uh, quarters <laughs> where you want to escape from the regulatory power, the social power of the state that is able to regulate capitalism, but it's actually opposite of something radical. And I think we need to call it out. And that's without even getting to the environmental costs of most forms of blockchain, which are, of course, are extreme. And if we scale up, as this idea would suggest, completely unsustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I wanted to ask now, I want to go back to Anita. Uh, Anita, your main, your work focuses a lot of um, injustice, injustice through the world, injustice through North and South, injustice through different companies, injustice in the society. Is it possible to think a virtual war free of injustice? Because the virtuality reflects what the world really is, but in a virtual paradigm. Is it possible to free ourselves from injustice in the digital world where injustice remains in society itself? Um, am I audible? I just had to reboot, so um, just checking. Yes? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Okay, thank you. So I think that uh, we may have to turn around the question a bit because the world of the digital indeed reflects, reinforces and rides on the real world. And um, if the real world is rife with injustice, then uh, the emancipation we seek as you know, creatures of the 21st century will have to be um, tying together the, the the, the context, the epoch, you know, in which we live. So through critique, through narrative possibilities and uh, through plural uh, visions of materialities, I think we already engage with the virtual space. I mean, this webinar is one such uh, example, of course, and that's how we begin to reimagine uh, society. And uh, of course, you know, because data is that thing which is simultaneously material and non-material and um, is a resource. It has multivalency, it has multiple meanings. Today, it is essentially appropriated for certain purposes to seize social, ecological, infrastructural control and thus becomes a coercive apparatus to sustain colony, right? So in fact, we um, do know from the work of Saskia Sassen that the entire, you know, subprime mortgage crisis were, happened because, you know, it was possible through computational prowess to be able to divide and make such small parts of that particular asset that, you know, you could actually uh, create a, a bubble. The story is not only of 
you know, geoeconomic injustice, we see really geopolitical interferences, right? Interference, for instance, in electoral processes uh, because of the way AI is organized. We see, um, uh, and this is also because of the infrastructures of social media, we see interferences in the way in which social welfare is delivered, you know, geopolitically because of foreign firms getting into the business of health delivery or the way in which certain governments use technology to gain illegitimate global power. And there is a certain risk of weaponization. And I think that this is something that we cannot ignore. Consortiums of European corporations and countries are coming together to define the remit of fintech, you know, what can be possible and what not. And I think therefore there's already a world where injustices are being redefined thanks to the material infrastructures of data and AI. And this really needs a new global constitutionalism. It might need us to revisit the human rights. And of course, uh, you know, the Secretary General in the UN has called for a summit of the future, but that I think is a political game. And some of us in civil society don't even understand how, where to begin really mounting our uh, critiques. So how do we decolonize? And I think here we really need a supraliberal framework. It's not enough to think about freedoms as restoration of privacy. I think freedoms <laughs> is about creating the conditions that sustain autonomy. And to create this autonomy, we need new normative and institutional orders, arrangements that can rethink the role of education and ed tech, for instance, should we at all you know, allow for profiteering through ed tech? You know, that's a very important question for egalitarianism. We need to think of distributive integrity in terms of how digitalization can produce jobs that are dignified. You know, and all the statistics are telling you that digitalization has decoupled productivity from employment since the late 1990s. So what do you do about that? And we need to address questions of decentralized controls, federal controls over AI and data and make them scrutinizable. And this is not about being carried away by the promises of tech companies who will tell you, we are not taking away your data, it's edge AI. It's you know, federated AI, and all of this is actually you know, pulling the wool over our eyes. These technologies anyway retain centralized control with corporations. So I think there is a lot of terrain for mounting our offensive, and I think we really need to be informed and build on our solidarities across movements to be able to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Thank you so much. Now back to Seda Mirijam, what do you think about open source software? Is it a form of resistance or just another instance for intellectual property capture of the capitalist system? What's your opinion on that? Uh, thanks, Sophia, for that question. And I just want to maybe pick up on what Anita was saying with like federated machine learning. And we saw some of this with the contact tracing apps as well, right? Google and Apple stepped in and said, we don't need the data. It can be privacy preserving, uh, but we want to be the go-to infrastructure for public health in, and governments in the future, right? And here we see again that data is not what is at stake, but the control of the computational infrastructure, um, as Anita was suggesting, right? Like the data they don't take it, but it gives them sufficient um, input to still manage those devices from a distance and to enforce policies for third parties, including governments and corporations. Um, so I think that um, is really important to remember. Also, when we look at the lower, like if we say there's data, there's no data without software and there's no software without hardware, right? And so where does open source software come in here? First, I want to make a distinction between open source and free software. Free software was much more um, about creating a digital infrastructure, uh, whereas open source was much, much more about producing software collectively and collaboratively for also commercial interest. So that division is, I think, really important to um, put together. But what they have both in common is they never, these communities never really thought about how compute was organized. So as a result, maybe it is not surprising that open source was almost fundamental to the development of the cloud infrastructure we have today. And I have um, a student that I'm very fortunate to work with, Nishan Shankar, who looks, for example, at the way in which open source mechanisms are used, let's say by a company like Uber, which will have one or five engineers working on a specific functionality on optimizing their resources. They'll pull engineers from other companies. You would think they're competitors, but the engineers will work together on fine tuning this 
op, let's say, uh, mechanism for um, optimizing resource management. And then if it gets really successful, Amazon will implement it on their cloud, optimize it, and make it available to many, many people. So it's, on the one hand, free labor of those engineers, although they're probably overpaid or underpaid, depending on how you see things by their companies. And then the software, once entered into the cloud, both creates more cloud dependencies, but also helps the evolution of the cloud. So Nishant is kind of working on this kind of structure. And I think it's really important to not just be idealistic about open source and say it will you know, make a difference. Now, having said that, um, one of the things um, we did um, when the, the COVID hit the university uh, with Tobias Fiebeck is that we installed open source software as an educational alternative to Zoom, uh, which we're also using today. And I hope one day we can convinced TNI to um, install BBB and Tobias Fiebig single-handedly put a streaming function on top of that so that, again, using the open source mentality, ensuring that we have open source streaming um, available to organizations so that we don't become more and more dependent on Zoom, who, by the way, does not really own that much computational infrastructure. They're as dependent on Amazon and Google and Apple as we are. So it's really interesting um, to think about, okay, what are the mechanisms through which we can make open source um, a way to um, give back more autonomy and, and give a pause to the financialization through tech that is coming at full speed at our educational institutions, for example. And one last thing about that, um, one of the things we did is we measured cloud dependency in higher education as COVID hit, um, but actually even before. And it was very interesting to notice that in, uh, this was mostly in the EU and the US, um, and it was interesting to see that Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and France have been um, investing in open source software and educational infrastructure, which meant that when COVID hit and everything went online, they could rely on their own, own infrastructure and did not Zoomify, as some people called it. Um, I put a link to the paper earlier in the chat. I can do it again. Uh, but I think open source has an important role to play in reclaiming institutions that are under the pressure to digitalize on the cloud. Thank you. Thank you, Seda. Miriam, you want to jump in? Yeah, if I have time, uh, I, I wouldn't mind uh, um, jumping in in the sense of <clears throat> having these different conversations, again, brings back the kind of uh, double critique that you can find in decolonization theory. But again, it, we're reminded when we talk about coloniality and decolonization, it's of course a terminology that emerged from actual anti-colonial struggles and we sometimes forget the intellectual contributions that have come from those struggles. And I think it's important to focus on the theories that came from, for instance, Algeria, Kenya, Burkina Faso, the intellectual tradition that uh, some of us have found inspiration in understanding also digital colonialism such as Walter Rodney, Sankara, Fanon, but also Eduardo Galeano about, about uh, another continent uh, that is closer to a lot of the viewers uh, here than, than mine. And this is important for me because again, uh, it brings back this difficult, uh, um, yeah, um, merging of, of, of theories and how to undo that. And I really think that there is uh, a difference between decolonization and the theories that they gave in how to understand digital infrastructures and decoloniality as a more recent uh, theory. And I really wanna uh, emphasize why it's important to differentiate and to bring back racial capitalism in the understanding of decolonization rather than decoloniality as a kind of philosophical uh, discourse because it helps us understand that uh, capitalism uh, is not just a means of dividing working classes like the wage workers from the enslaved. I don't know what Jack thinks of that in terms of his analogy with slavery, but in this case racial capitalism is also the one that organizes the contradictions between waged and unwaged uh, workers, between the owners of wealth and the land and the dispossessed. And so how do you think about this when you think about digital um, infrastructures? And I think it's important because if we look at, for instance, some of the intellectual contributions from sort of decolonizing uh, theories, we can look at Frantz Fanon and how he wrote about uh, the uh, economy uh, in, in Africa and in, in the continent, uh, you can, I guess, stretch this to uh, many parts of the world, 
where the economic infrastructure uh, was also the superstructure in the colonies. So it is the base and the superstructure in the colonies. And this is how we need to, I think, in, take inspiration from uh, uh, the writings of people like Fanon uh, in, in trying to understand the data coloniality uh, 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 as we do today. And I, I want to uh, end by giving an example that is often not mentioned because I guess it's politically also uh, difficult for people to talk about Palestine, Israel, particularly in higher education, but hopefully not uh, beyond Europe and uh, North uh, America because it is such a concrete case study of understanding data colonialism, both uh, as a sort of, you know, as, a, as, a, as a, the meta analysis and as the angle through which to understand resistance. I mean, Anita and others have spoken about the importance to look at also the, uh, the anchoring also resistance. And I wanna just give us an example and invite people to look into the case of uh, uh, the, the, the struggle against Google where Google actually provides the kind of services and, and, and tool that uh, supports and, and, and works with the Israeli military. And I think it's really inspirational to look at the case of Google and also Amazon in providing the infrastructures for Israeli governments, uh, because there has been resistance from within uh, these companies. And that's, we forget that, you know, like there have been recently uh, petitions and open letters by uh, people who work inside uh, uh, these big corporations and who've spoken out and who have called for BDS, who've called that Google and Amazon should divest from, uh, from Israel. And so I think this is an important example for me to end with because then it's kind of like full, full circle when we discuss decolonization and decoloniality as forms of resistance this is also part of that narrative. The people at Google who are losing their jobs, who have set up petitions, who are calling for solidarity because they have raised their voices uh, and uh, argued against uh, the use of AI tools to enable racist uh, uh, policies and apartheid in Israel. Thank you, Mirjam. It's really inspiring the case of all these workers who speak up like Tim Nikebru and uh, the recent uh, Amazon um, labor union, how it's how it's being made and how resistance is being built from inside the companies. So thank you very much. Uh, now to Jack, uh, I don't know if you want to answer Miriam's comment, but I do have a question for you also. So I'm going to make it and then give you the floor in, uh, so you can answer everything together. And you mentioned you 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 really draw us a picture of how slavery in um, uh, China and other countries has been made when we produce the hardware. And do you think the only uh, we only have slavery on hardware production or also in software production when they grab out data, for example, without being paid for the value that we create? Do you think there is a cognitive a slavery in the digital capitalism system? Thank you, uh, Sophia. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, uh, just now in my 15 minutes, I only focused on manufacturing labor, okay, because uh, other panelists, okay, in today, today they know more and, uh, uh, and they have gone deeper, okay, into the analysis of what I would call manufactured labor, okay, including uh, different forms of immaterial labor, including software engineers. And when I was preparing for this book, actually I digged out an old, even older book, believe it or not, it was from 2000. It was a popular kind of book, okay, called Net Slave, right? It, but written by two former software uh, engineers uh, in the Silicon Valley. Okay. Actually, so they were already talking about, this was the year when Terra Nova just uh, published uh, her work on free labor, okay, but then they were al already uh, 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 book length treatments about how uh, 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 you know uh, software uh, workers are being treated in a precarious way, okay, in and even uh, also similar to uh, 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 free labor because they are supposed to be uh, their their only wage, uh, you know, is their is their passion. Okay, they were chasing their passion, right? So that is actually, if we go back, okay, to um, 
uh, uh, which I, I think uh, the most important sociological definition of uh, slavery is by Orlando Patterson, uh, you know, defining slavery as the social death, right? So if a, uh, just, so even though the Silicon Valley programmer and the uh, Chinese fact, uh, Foxconn worker are, uh, have an entire Pacific Ocean, you know, in between them, but actually the, both of them do not have control over, they have, they have ultimately lost their control over their working conditions and also over their social life. They become, okay, uh, the book gave uh, detailed how uh, workers are uh, de-socialized, okay? And even though the software engineers are, may, some of them have PhDs, right? And others are supposed to have very highly skilled work, but, okay, they could be subject to social death at any time. In uh, Orlando Patterson's book, the social, uh, about the social death, okay, of uh, slavery, he actually quoted, uh, particular category of uh, high class slavery in ancient Rome and the uh, in the Roman Empire they are called pardon my Latin is called they are called familia Caesaris okay so these are slaves of the emperor of Caesar when Caesar left Rome uh, his appointed slave his favorite slave would become the mayor of Rome okay and uh, can command immense wealth and army okay, and, and state violence. But when Caesar, uh, uh, you know, thought, uh, uh, get rid of this slave, okay? Uh, so unlike a uh, average uh, Roman citizen at the time who have to go through a legal process to be executed, right? If the, uh, even, even, even if I were a uh, familiar Caesaris uh, yesterday, but today when the emperor doesn't like me, I can be killed. I can be disposed of without any legal procedure. Okay, so this is the social death. So in this case, uh, it's not only the poorly paid uh, uh, software engineer, but even some of the highly paid because they are mentally addicted okay, to the uh, colonial mindset, okay, to the uh, uh, slavery servile attitude, okay. So they are even, uh, if you watch Hollywood film like uh, Django uh, Unchained, okay, it's oftentimes, uh, you know, people of the same race, right, who, uh, the, of the, of darker skin, they, they, they internalized this hierarchy of slavery or colonialism even deeper than the white uh, slave master. Right, and so I think there's a important lesson, you know, that we can learn, which also have a revolutionary implication. That is, in order to fight uh, slavery or colonialism or uh, white supremacy or digital capitalism in its worst form, intellectuals, okay, again, we you know have to uh, follow the footsteps of uh, Gramsci, okay, to bring in intellectual resources, right, to uh, uh, to start the abolition from the mindset. Right? And with this, I want to echo, and maybe I would say, uh, 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 share some footnotes, okay? Share, add a footnote to what uh, Miriam just said. Right? So this was the campaign I started uh, behind the beginning of my book right, more than 10 years ago against the uh, 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 suicides, okay, and globally, okay, I think this was in the Silicon Valley, this was in Hong Kong, my former colleagues are here, and this is the biggest uh, and the uh, 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 Apple store in Hong Kong, and the campaign had more than a quarter million, okay, people participating online. This is important, but I would argue, like uh, Miriam said, it's even more important to look at the, the regional and the historical, okay, legacies, Okay, in China, like in most other parts of Africa, Asia, Latin America, there were revolutionary legacies that we will be ignoring at our peril. So in the Chinese context, for example, these are workers forum uh, organized by old Maoists. Even though you don't read uh, Chinese, you probably can get the aesthetic. Okay, use using Maoism against capitalism. There are still uh, many people using traditional web 1.0 uh, means to, to revive, to continue the struggle. But then the younger generation, <coughs> uh, migrant workers, they were use, using the Chinese uh, equivalent of Twitter to share uh, protest strategies. Okay, again, I won't have time to explain. 
and uh, on WeChat too, all right, and this is the uh, uh, dominant social media in China now. But what I would like just to uh, to, to show you one more poetry, okay? This is actually not from a, 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 um, a, a, a electronic hardware factory. This is a shoe factory. This was the world's largest shoe factory back in 2014. They make Nikes, they make Adidas, they make all the brands that you heard about okay, in the same factory. And then when the, uh, some workers were retiring, they, uh, uh, they found out their uh, pension funds were not paid. So they have to uh, retire without their pension funds. And then in the struggle, so they wrote uh, this, this poetry. So what I would argue, okay, uh, 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 to add to, you know, is that the, the line between hardware and software, between material and immaterial, between industrial worker and informational worker is actually not always correct. Sometimes a shoe factory, okay, uh, uh, this is a Chinese factory, okay, using a format, the, the poetic format is from a thousand years ago from Song Dynasty, and the reference is actually very uh, Maoist, right? And then, so, so uh, 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 hardware workers can do software work, okay? Maybe not the, in terms of coding, but in terms of social uh, networking. And then it, this is how it read, officials collude with bosses. Insurance becomes our losses. What a pity, workers. Our youthful years, just a fuss. Strike, strike. The peak of labor movement is upon us. Right? So this uh, 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 kind of, this is our meme, okay, from, um, from the meme. I want to uh, point out here is that there are also many, uh, in addition to, going back to our own cultural roots, okay, to understand the uh, revolutionary, the anti-colonial, uh, uh, anti-racist roots of 21st century slavery, we can, uh, uh, 21st century abolition movement. We can go even further back. Okay, so this was the anti-slavery movement. Uh, the lessons uh, that were uh, learned from the Atlantic theater, of uh, including the American Civil War, but also around the whole Atlantic, you know, in the, in the first half of the 19th century, those lessons should not be lost in history. In the 21st century, you know, we need to go back. They were they were not exactly the same kind of software programmers, but when the 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 motley crew of uh, 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 um, of anti-slavery, uh, uh, you know, uh, was formed in the early and mid 19th century, is precisely about connecting, networking, okay, the people of different races, different genders, different occupations, no matter what, whether they are doing hardware or software contents, because they are subject to the same uh, 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 dispossession uh, process of digital capitalism. That's where uh, solidarity uh, need to form beyond professional and uh, or any other kind of existing boundaries. Thank you, Jack. And now we had a, a, a question for Nick that he kindly replied already on the Q&A uh, chat box. But now for closing, because we are running out of time, really short from all of you panelists, I want to listen to you, but really, really short because we don't have much time, uh, about what strategies or priorities for movements in terms of mobilization right now should be, what are the weakness of weak tech, uh, big tech companies that social movie movements can exploit, or where, uh, what would, should be the role of the states in resisting this? Like, I want to hear what type of resistance can we build from civil society, from social movements, and um, from the states in order to resist this colonialism and this digital capitalism. So just to give some ideas uh, to our other panelists and to the participants in order to look forward to keep resistant this type of, these new forms of exploitation. Nick, first you go. We could do it in the order that we spoke. Well, that's a very big question to talk <laughs> briefly about. Um, what? First of all, a reaction to this fantastic panel, which has been extremely interesting and provocative for me. And what it brings out is that there are many overlapping perspectives 
on this massive transformation that's going on. Uh, and we need to try and somehow, but it's impossible for one human being to do it, to hold them all in view. Uh, and the panel has brought that out. Um, so I very much agree with Seder and Miriam, for example, that what's going on with capitalism and colonialism is not only about data, it's also about the deep hardware, which underlies the possibility of data. We need, but it's also, also sometimes about data and the exploiting of the Amazon worker on the warehouse floor through surveillance, which is done by data. So we need to understand all these things. And the key word for me was that I need to use was solidarity. Um, to confront something this large, we need to find the sources of building solidarity between intellectual positions, between different imaginaries, and of course, between different forms of suffering. Um, and at the moment, there's absolutely no basis in contemporary polarized societies for building solidarity between um, the fox eye slave that Jack talks about and the person who is using that phone to send pictures to their friends of a nice meal they've just had. There's no basis for solidarity uh, between me wanting my package to arrive on time because I need it for a birthday present and the Amazon worker who's tracked around the warehouse floor to get that to me on time. But we need to form those bases for solidarity. And that's where I, I think the importance of alliances between activists and academics is incredibly important. Um, because without that, we need to feed our work as academics into the work that activists are doing. And that's why uh, Ulysses and I with Paolo Ricalti in Mexico have, have helped set up a wonderful network called Tierra Comun, um, mainly Latin American based, which is based around the work of bringing together activists and academics. We have our first meeting in Mexico City in, the, in December. Finally, after the pandemic, we can come together. Um, we need to find new ways, new forms for bringing solidarity. And the work of TNI is obviously, and, and Anita in India is obviously very important to that too. That's the thing I want to stress. Thank you, Nick. Really, solidarity is the answer for most of our um, uh, struggles worldwide. Anita, you, you, I want, we want to hear from you also. Um, thank you. I'm trying to get my video on. Yes. So I think coming from the global south, one has to really um, be comfortable with uh, being uh, playing multiple roles. And I, I guess that's true also for activists in the global north. Sometimes your positionalities as people who are advising your local governments is very, very different from how you might actually be, um, you know, taking on your state, um, you know, with resistance movements on the street, you know, for restoration of data democracy. But maybe at the WTO or at the WIPO, you know, you will stand shoulder to shoulder with your, uh, you know, country representatives, ambassadors and tell them what exactly is to be done. I think these antagonisms, these conflicting positionalities, I think we really have to reconcile ourselves with because state capacity to understand the data phenomenon is really work in progress in the global south. Um, I would really say that we need solid experiments in um, the social and solidarity economies, and we should really start supporting women-run enterprises that are built on ethos of uh, an ethos of platform cooperativism. The state needs to really come in, step up. In the state of Kerala recently, uh, a public supported infrastructure for an Uber-like initiative uh, came up, and I think uh, you know, without all of those, there's really no way you can take on global capital. I think that uh, job creation uh, is still a very, very important mandate of democracies, and that is really uh, the state's function. And therefore, I think that some solid um, local initiatives that we can uh, lobby for with our governments, which can show us how public data and digital infrastructures look is very important. And earlier today, I think Nick mentioned that constantly thinking about incursions into our privacy and converting uh, everything into a conspiratorial surveillance order, I think has a limited purpose. We need to start articulating from the other side, what do we think are freedoms and, uh, you know, and developmental justice in the context of uh, uh, data world. So I do think that 
you know, taking on the corporation is very important because the corporation in, in, in the digital age is not just big tech. And I think it is the technologification or the datafication of big pharma, big agri and big everything, big finance. And I think that really requires us to go back to the table and think about how we mount an offensive. And lastly, I do think that a very concrete entry point for us at IT for Change, and we do really need the support of all of you here, is to start thinking about data rights as labor rights. And hopefully someday, not so far in the future, the ILO can adopt a resolution towards the same. And we need to work towards that. Thank you, Anita. Seda Mirijam. Miri, you go first. Okay, yeah. Um... I mean, this is a really good question uh, to end with, and it's a kind of like allows us to be a bit more uh, free in our uh, <laughs> radical politics. And I would say that for me, uh, uh, in the debates about um, the, the, the principal question of what can we do and how do we do it, for me, it's uh, not very different from the principal question that has appeared uh, with the war on um, Ukraine. And we had uh, an event where we were invited with Titi Pai, with Seda, myself, Helen, and, and, and Femke, and were asked, so what do we do? And I think it's because there's this complexity about issues that you are not in control of or far away, and that there's this understanding of what can I do my own. And I think I formulated it in in a sort of as a triangle, I said, first of all, what the kind of what can we do thing? I think, first of all, our, our responsibility uh, is to accommodate uh, or even better proactively set up uh, campaigns. So not just waiting for others to do stuff, but especially as academics who do a lot of analysis and writing and who rely on a lot of people's anecdotes and stories, how can we ourselves proactively support and set up initiatives. And there are ways to do that. There are infrastructures uh, of resistance, such as our local union, uh, the students groups in our faculties, the community organizers, those are infrastructures that we can uh, work with to initiate also something. And for me, this is very important because it brings back the kind of uh, a principle that, uh, 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 for instance, uh, Rosa Luxemburg is very known of, of the idea of the enemy is at home. It's not just that the evil uh, US corporations or the evil this or that. What is the enemy at home? Uh, so point to the hypocrisy of in our own uh, uh, environment. So point to the hypocrisy of the European Union or the British government who are very well uh, at developing and designing technologies uh, for surveilling borders. So they have the best technologies and designs for surveilling borders and doing sort of, you know, anti-terror, but there's no design and no development for rescuing people uh, who are drowning in boats at our coasts. That's hypocrisy. So that's one thing we do. The second thing is if you can't directly be involved because there are situations where you can't, where you are uh, um, a junior worker, where you're not unionized or whatever, support those who do the struggle. So that is for me a very, uh, important principle, international solidarity. Support the Google and Amazon workers that are doing struggles, that are calling for solidarity with Palestinians. They need this support also because this kind of solidarity on an international level can help them against their corporations. Support Palestinians who are resisting uh, checkpoints. Support black organizers in the US or Britain who are resisting policing. Support Muslim communities and organizations who've been subjectified for more than 20 years now since 9-11 to uh, things that better uh, be explained and, and read through the work of Arun Kunani. And the last thing is archive, archive this, write about this, reproduce what you have uh, uh, written somewhere else or archived yourself. In, it's so important to remind uh, ourselves and people around us to produce knowledge that is outside hegemonic knowledge. There's such an attack on historical and material uh, 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 um, uh, academia in our sciences, this push for this neoliberal digital humanities that doesn't want to talk about the past, that doesn't want to talk about materiality. There is an ideological uh, agenda for this push against it. So archive, we need to make our own uh, uh, production of uh, knowledge. Don't just rely on what uh, our uh, mainstream syllabi or handbooks are telling us. So as 
to allow people ourselves and our people around us to ask the how question, the question that said I mentioned, the how is this then happening? This is very important for two reasons. The history of resistance that is there, uh, sometimes buried, is a very important antidote for cynicism and for the hopelessness that we see now. A lot of people are cynical and hopeless. These corporations are too big, we can't change it. There's a whole history of resistance that we can actually take energy from. And the second thing is, it's very important because we need to hold these corporations and states and their and their stakeholders accountable. Holding accountable needs archiving. And I think that's why also that is an important thing we can do. So if you can't do the first or the second, you can do the third. Thank you, Mirjam. Uh, say that really short because we need yeah, time. Sure. For I think, um, yeah, just very quickly. I think there's a way in which technology creates a, a picture of a society where it's the tech companies versus individuals and erases the role of organizations and institutions for our societies. And the fact that almost every organization or institution is scrambling to get on board with digital transformation or AI suggests that they're ready for some change. So I think a great form of resistance mm -hmm. is to engage our institutions and to ask for them to change, not to digital to digitalize and go on the cloud, uh, but to serve us. Um, and maybe just one last thing. Every gig worker is basically symptomatic of, a, of the gutting out of one of these organizations and the services they provide or the operations they provide to society. So we should not stop at labor rights, but look to see if this gig work is happening there, what is it gutting out in the organization and reimagine the organization, not just in terms of labor rights, but also what it can do to serve communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Seda. Jack? Yes, my last words, okay, uh, in addition to the brilliant input we already got so far, uh, first is uh, uh, no matter is uh, the state, I don't, I, I, I don't think uh, we should put uh, blind faith in the state or civil society organizations. Uh, the, unless the state uh, agencies, unless the civil society organizations are truly the people belong truly belong to the people to the working people otherwise uh, you know in the global south we see so many cases of uh, corrupt corrupted officials and corrupted civil society career bureaucrats okay making making things worse so in addition to solidarity which i cannot agree more but i like, i like to ask why sometimes solidarity can materialize and have structural uh, sustainable structural you know, uh, progress as a result, but other time cannot. In the history of uh, anti-slavery, there were countless uh, uprisings, runaways, mutinies. Some of them become maroons, okay, become larger. Some of them actually become Haiti, okay, the Haiti revolution, right? And so I think this is where in Chinese we have a saying to say, uh, okay, 天时 means timing, okay? Loc location, Renhe is solidarity. Okay. So you know, only having solidarity is not enough. We need to have a geopolitical base. Maoist would call it the revolutionary base, which is the anti-slavery okay, uh, uh, equivalent of um, maroons, where people get to have their, build their own states, build our own bottom-up uh, uh, organizations, okay, and then wait for the time. The time of geopolitical uh, you know, crash, the time when great uh, empires started to clash with each other, which we are seeing now, and then when the digital, digital capitalist, this is my last words, digital capitalist will make fatal mistakes. When that timing comes, we are ready wherever we are. Thank you.